Israel stopped and stayed and how God led them in the wilderness 38 years and we compare it to our past. And this is the introduction, the first message of Moses, chapters 1 to 4. And as we think we have escaped Egypt through the deliverer, Jesus Christ, that bondage to slavery to sin, now we're free in Christ. We learn from what happened to Israel to what happens to you and I today in Christ. Because we have better promises. And chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, is a thesis statement by Moses. As those that write papers, the, the first paragraph of any essay or paper you're writing will have an essay statement up front. And it really captures what the whole message is about. And it's amazing how God inspired, because Moses wrote it, yes, but God inspired him to write it too, together. Just as you and I today are led of the Spirit if you be a children of God, Romans chapter 8. We are led by the Spirit if we're children of God. I'll start out with a little prayer from Psalm 44. Lord God, we thank you that we can identify with Jesus Christ today. We thank you for the type that Moses was as a deliverer. What he represents for Israel, you represent for us today. And for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. We know that Paul quotes this in Romans Jesus was definitely like this when he came as the Lamb of God and that we may follow the footsteps of Jesus and those that follow Jesus. By your grace and mercy, amen. Let's open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, which is, 11 points of a thesis statement. When you break up these two verses, they're in a divine order, sequence, because they're not chaotic, hopscotch, here and there. At this point, what is happening in the life of Moses and Israel in Deuteronomy? He's preparing them for the battle to come to enter the promised land. Through this whole book, there's three messages. And we have a battle plan, a battle that we have today, a spiritual battle and a promised land. Them, it was physical, outward. Us, it's spiritual and inward. Well, chapter 4, verse 1, and before I get there, I had thoughts of this. Imagine you're in a tsunami or an area where there's a flood, and you have to go higher ground, and the flood keeps coming, and you have to go higher and higher, and you think as never before, you're in a critical spot where that's all your attention is, how am I going to survive? And those with me. That's what Moses is preparing them for. That flood that's coming in is like the enemy, and he's preparing them for battle in the land of Canaan, the promised land. As he's 
God's prayer preparing us in Christ for the battle that we're in daily for the promised land. What is our promised land? Is it physical Israel? No. Is it in the future? Yes. It's reigning with Christ and the new Jerusalem, Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22. That's the same place that Jesus saw on the cross, and he humbled himself and came obedient unto death, even the shame of the cross, seeing the joy that was set before him, the kingdom of God. And we can experience some of that today, limited, but it's fully going to come. And we want to prepare for it as Moses, God right and through him, was preparing Israel for entering into that battle with Canaan. The first two words, now therefore, hearken. Now therefore, looking back at chapters 1 to 3, forget about the past. Now let's look at the present and the future. And we have to do that several times too. Hearken, listen. Listening, God speaking all the time. Ephesians 1.13, there's some handout verses I'm not going to go over in the New Testament where the equivalents I will do a few. But the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, he that has an ear, let him hear. And he says, he that overcomes. These are two critical phrases. And the Spirit speaks to the churches, plural, representing individual churches, geographically, representing for each one of us, wherever it falls, the whole seven churches, and sometimes you believe historically too. But to put on those ears that are listening, attention. So Moses wants them to listen to what he's saying. And who is he speaking to? Oh, Israel. The same is in Ephesians 1.22, and I'm going to turn there, I don't have the verses, but um, I'll just go a little bit in Ephesians. 1.13 says, In whom also you, tr you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the spirit of promise. Did God make a promise to us? We're sealed with. Did he make a promise or covenant with Israel? Yes. You shall inherit this land. How the inherited unfolds all the way through the Old Testament. All the ups and downs. But in Christ Jesus, we have better promises. But we still have a different inheritance. But similar pattern. Ephesians 1.22 and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. The Ecclesia, called out ones. Chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians are our position of rest, prayer, identification with Jesus Christ and prayer, doctrine, things to understand in our mind, in our heart. Because what we... Do by faith is what we understand the scripture says and obey. That goes the position of rest, sitting. He's made us to sit with Christ in heavenly places. Then we can walk and speak the things of the Lord. We're prepared for the walk. Chapter 4, 1 to 6, verse 9. Then we can stand. And put on that armor of God for warfare with the enemy. It's in order, on purpose, by design. 
this spiritual warfare that we are part of, that we may be victorious, overcomers, personally, first of all. So Ephesians, that's enough for out of the, let's see, 321. That's also chapter 3, verse 21. Unto him, Jesus, be glory in the church, in our, by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That's how he ends his prayer. Paul for the church. So those two longest prayers in chapters 1 and 3 are precious to learn from. The third point, hear what? The statutes and the judgments. Statutes are written things. Even today, the law that Congress makes, they call them statutes. Then they get more laws from there. But the, the statutes that God writes are specific, not general, broad. And they're to be understood. In our mind, without simplicity, even as a child. But yet they're complex because we have to study, we have to be in the Word, and grow in the faith and obedient so we understand what it says. And as we're obedient, he reveals more. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And that transform life. So the statutes and the judgments. Ephesians 5, 15 to 21, talking about our walk. And we talked about this Friday night, Ephesians Verse 15, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Is the evil getting more and more? That's a call for you and I to rise as the flood of evil is rising, for us to be more and more in Christ. Thessalonians did it excellently. One and two Thessalonians. They were prepared for the rapture. God was preparing them. Are you ready for that rapture? Rapture ready. So the statutes are things that are written. And then what do we do with the things that are written? We judge. We make discernment. This is good. This is evil. What is your will, Lord? Is this my my will or your will? Is this pride in me? Or is this humility or Christ in me? So in Ephesians, he talks first about the personal life and speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making a melody in your heart to the Lord. As we're right with the Lord, he gives us a song, a melody. And then he talks about husbands and wives, and then children with parents, a family, and then work, servants and masters. So he deals with these relationships. First deal with ourselves, and then the family, then the work. Kind of the priority of judgments. Because there's a wonderful verse in Corinthians that says, that we're battling spiritual strongholds and they're in the mind. And I don't paraphrase. Oh, someone tell me. When your obedience is fulfilled, obeying the Lord, have a readiness in mind to bring others into obedience. I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> to, but it's, it's something our obedience has to be fulfilled first before we're content, before we're complete in the Lord. Then we bring others to others' minds. How? Through the word, through prayer, through personal example. Those three things. The fourth point, which I teach you, 
there is a teaching going on from Moses as a leader. Jesus taught as a leader. The 12 apostles taught and even wrote scriptures down. That's the foundation of the church as leaders. And we're to teach others to teach others. Ephesians 4.20 goes into that. He's given different gifts. Oh, but you have not so learned Christ. If be so that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That goes along with it. Then he goes, put off the old man, put on the new. All that's related in Ephesians. That's a daily thing to do. And, and as we do it daily, it becomes easier to do. <laughs> and it becomes a habit, natural. We want to get naturally doing the right things. And that's where blessings are. That's where contentment and happiness, eternal happiness. Not looking at outward things, at others, looking at Christ. Eyes upward, looking ahead, what he's promised us. The fifth point, for to do them. Okay. After you teach them, for others to do them. They may or may not do them, but we must teach rightly. Be that example, such as with your children. We want them to do them. Physical children. We want our spiritual children too. There's no greater rejoicing than spiritual family of God and the spiritual children growing in the Lord. That is a great joy, which New Testament Paul talks of several times in different ways. He rejoices in that. John 13, 17, if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. How can we be happy and sorrowful at the same time? How can we rejoice? And still through a tragedy, a hardship? It's only Christ in us because we're just pilgrims going through on this earth, this world. Let's look at the next thing, that ye may live life. Sometimes if we're not in Christ, we're walking dead, although we don't realize it. And once you come to Christ, we understand, as I used to be, while I was dead of my sins, Christ died for me, yet I believed in him. Romans 6.23 talks of, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You realize we use that for salvation, but it's also for our sanctification. Sin produces death in us as his people, the people of God. Not eternal death, no. The death of losing the joy of the Lord, walking with him. Growing in Christ. That's what it's talking about really in Romans 6, verse 23. But it applies for the unsaved too. Live. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. Life, eternal life, more abundant as we grow in Christ. John 10:10. 10, 10. The seventh point, go in and possess the land. He's preparing them to go in and possess the promised land. As God, through Jesus Christ, or I should say Jesus is working in us because we have an inheritance. We're heirs to this eternal kingdom. He's preparing us through his word, through the Christ in us, through each other, through obedience to possess a land. And we possess a land that the enemy has spiritually. We don't go in physically. Our battle is uh, against wickedness in high places. This next point, possessing the land, which the Lord God of your Father gives you. And I'll turn to Ephesians 2.20. The Lord God, 
Jehovah and God is uh, El of your fathers. Who were their fathers? Israel? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, which came Israel and the 12 tribes. Who is our father? In heaven, yes, but who's our spiritual fathers? The 12 apostles. They are our fathers in reality, going back to they're the ones that wrote the New Testament. All 27 books, except for James and Jude, who the half-brothers of Jesus wrote. So I would say that's honorary, as being the half-brothers of Jesus, James and Jude. Ephesians 2.20 says, did I say 2.20? Yes. Oh, I got in Galatians 2.20. That's the wrong one. <laughs> Yes, Ephesians 2.20 is a favorite verse. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. There were 12 apostles, and until the church was formed, and there were some apostles, uh, prophets, but they faded away. There's no apostles or prophets today. And Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we're built up upon what... The apostles did and lived and what they were inspired to write and left for us. That builds us up. We're a spiritual building within ourselves and then as a parent and wherever we go. Next, verse 2. Ye shall add unto the, not add unto the word which I command you. Where else does it say that about adding and taking away from the word revelation of this book? This is the Old Te Testament equivalent. Proverbs 36 says, you shall not add unto the word. Why does it say only add wisdom instead of add or delete? Because when we add unto what the scriptures say, we're going to forget what it really does say. We give it too much. <laughs> and that's certainly what the Pharisees did and the scribes. They added to it. And he's talking about the law of Moses. Neither shall ye diminish from it. Matthew 5.18 says, Not one jot or tittle, one dot of the I or cross of the T shall pass away so everything of the law of Moses be fulfilled. What Moses wrote, and what in Genesis through Deuteronomy, is permanent. As it applied to Israel, they still go by the law. And they're blinded to Jesus Christ. Why do we keep to the word? That you may keep the commandments of the Lord which I command you. So God has given us commandments through Jesus Christ. We say, oh, we don't go by commandments and laws today, do's and don'ts. When you read the New Testament, and I'll give an example, Romans chapter 12 to 16. There's 121 commandments. About 70 do this. 50 don't do this. Well, it's still the same, but ours, we have a strength, a power through the Holy Spirit in us. They didn't have in the Old Testament. It isn't standard practice or God's design for us to be like Israel, going up and down and Defeat and going after idols, other gods, and coming back and repenting. That cycle. That isn't God's plan in the better promises in Jesus Christ. He's created us, designed that we grow in Christ until that perfect, mature man, each one of his children. So let's look at the rest of Deuteronomy chapter 4. 
And I would say this is part two of his first message. Verse four. But you did cleave unto the Lord your God and are alive, every one of you, today. You know, a whole generation, over 600,000 died in the desert because of their disobedience. A whole 20 and above. We learn from that today. Verse 5, Behold, I've taught you statutes and judgments. That word, statutes and judgments, is going to be used. There's key words in Deuteronomy. Commands. God is a commander through Moses. Jesus is our commander, really. He's all of our commander. And then the pastor under Jesus is 86 times that word. Hearken or hear 82 times in Deuter Deuteronomy alone. This day, he's at the end of his life. Maybe the last month he's given these three messages. 77 times he says, this day. Then he speaks to the heart, 45. Then he talks of the commandments of God, which are the law of Moses, written, statutes, 42 times. He speaks of love. Although they didn't understand the love of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial love, in the Old Testament sense, 21 times. Statutes and judgments, 17 times. And he says, don't forget and remember. That's why we go to church and gather with other believers. We meet in small groups. Is If we don't, we, we forget things. We get caught up in the world. We get caught up in the busyness of life. No matter if you're poor or rich. No matter what party you are. But in this world has a, a way of doing that. And we must remember things. And then teaching 13, and just chapters 4 and 5, which will go into next week, start in 5, he talks of a fire. The fire at Mount Sinai, where the law was given. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Because that's neat. There is a mountain in the desert of Israel, the alternate place where archaeology found a mountain with a rock split in two not the traditional Mount Sinai, where the mountain is burnt on the top. Amazing. But either place it was, it, the same message of the law applies, and it's powerful. Even the last words of Malachi talk of the last book of the New, Old Testament, of statutes and judgments of God. This term isn't used in the New Testament, because Christ is greater than. He's a better teacher. He gives us more wisdom than Solomon. I know I said that wrong, but forgive me. <laughs> and being in Christ is such better precious promise that we have today. But we learn from the Old Testament. So that's mentioned 13 times. Let's go through a few things in these chapter 4 to finish. Verse 8. And he talks about a nation. Israel was a nation at that time. Is, uh, Portugal is a nation. The United States of America is a nation. Keep therefore and do them, the statutes and judgments, for this is your wisdom and understanding. We get wisdom and understanding from the scriptures. In the sight of the nations before others which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. I believe the United States of America, when it was founded, was known from other nations for its stand on the Bible. In the past, we have left it greatly. Next summer, the United States of America has taken the lead to have world gay pride celebration in D.C. Whole three weeks, a big venue, they're given to whoever's going to be leading the nation 
they have already planned on it. And this is, let's continue. Verse 7, for what nation is there so great who is God so near to them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great and has statutes and judgments? The laws that are based upon the Bible is what makes a nation great. And that's what made Israel great then compared to other nations. Things were fair, were just. And he addressed to do what was right in the eyes of God and with each other. So righteous as all this law which I set before you this day. Then he talks to them, only take heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. But teach them to your sons and thy son's sons. So we see that as a nation, then he goes in verses 10 to 24. They were Mount Sinai. I want to draw your attention to one verse. And he declared, verse 13, unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. The centrality of the ten commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not, all these, you shall have no other gods before me. Make no images. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Honor your parents. All of them. He wrote them upon two tablets of stone. This is the fourth time he speaks of the Ten Commandments. That is the core. And we still have nine of them effective today because Christ is our Sabbath. He's our rest as we walk in him. We don't get weary. We bring it to him. So they actually heard God speak to the two million people in Mount Sinai. They heard God speak. All of them. Only time in history. That nation heard God speak from the mountain. And it caused them to fear God. And they said, don't speak no more to us. When God speaks, it's like the trump of God, a great sound, loud. The trump of God. And they said, Moses, you go up and listen to God yourself. We, we can't hear this no more. It was so profound. And they didn't see God. They just had uh, heard him. There was no images. Then he says, take no images to yourself of any animals, even the sun, moon, and stars. Do we have images outward today in our culture? No. But there's other things we put before God, before following Jesus Christ. We, they, that they come in less and less. That's part of growing in Christ, leaving those things. Then verse 20. But the Lord has taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace. We were in the iron furnace when we were lost in sin. We were doing our own things, no matter how good or evil we were. We were still all in that iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as you are this day. And he's taken us all out of Egypt. Never forget the day you came to Christ. You won't if you truly came to Christ, whether it be a gradual process or all of a sudden. Both count because the produce of fruit is what shows it was true. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sake. So Moses couldn't enter the promised land because he was listening to the people complaining and over and over. Then he struck the rock twice. So he couldn't enter himself because of them. Not that he blamed them. God, God puts the blame where it belongs. <laughs> and it stays there when God puts the blame. So Moses couldn't enter on, enter the promised land, even though he begged God and pleaded, let me enter. No, my judgment has been, you can't enter. 
Then verse 26, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. This is a prophecy that Moses is writing because he knows Israel is not going to do well. That ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land wherein you go over Jordan to possess it. The battle of Jericho. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall be utterly destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. You'll be few left in number among the heathen. Where the Lord shall lead you. God was even in that when Israel was scattered during Babylon when they came in. He told them through the prophets it was coming. And then he brought them back. God's plan, design. When the Romans, when Jesus came, when the temple was destroyed, they were dispersed. They came back, 1948, the second time. And there's a third time they're going to be scattered too, during the tribulation. But God's going to bring them back the third time before his return. It's already prophesied. God knew it. And he's inspiring Moses, because Moses didn't know this. He didn't know nothing except what God revealed to him. And the same with us today. Going back to Joshua and that battle plan and entering the promised land, Canaan, spiritually, how are we to do it? We need our directions from God through the Holy Spirit, where if you be children of God, you be led of the Spirit, Romans 8. But how to get there? That's the, Moses is preparing us for the floods. He's preparing Israel in these messages. Some of the things he'll repeat, but he adds to it. And some things he'll leave out. As he's repeating in Deuteronomy, the law of Moses, just before his death. So next week, if you go to 5 and 6, but we, his whole second message is chapters 5 to 26. That's a lot. So I don't think I'll cover all that, but I, I'll pray and see how much to cover because I'm in no hurry to go through it and just to cover a book. It's where it may be a spiritual blessings where God is speaking to your heart and speaking to us through his word. That's what really counts. That is eternal. And before we finish, there's a, a few things coming up. Where is it? Uh, oh, the Museum of the Bible has special things. Maybe I should say this after I pray or before I pray. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. You try to do things that make sense as you follow an order of doing things. Yes. And uh, just as we pray about chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, the thesis statement, verses 1 and 2. Those, th uh, how many points was it? 11? Yeah, 11 points. God still speaks to us. He doesn't change. We're his people today. It's Israel was his people in the Old Testament. Are you a child of God? You say, yes. And then you can say, let the word speak to you. And it'll give you strength. It'll give you boldness. It'll help you be patient with those that are less fortunate, that are more needful. Be sensitive to the Spirit leading us for ourselves and with each other. These things are precious for the time we're in now, for all time, and for the future. Lord God, as you spoke through Moses in Deuteronomy 4, and the enemy coming in, and we see the enemy getting stronger, it's a reason for us to grow stronger in Christ. It's to draw closer together. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, that you may lift us up, Lord, and that we can give you the glory, because you're doing it. I pray for the, this place as a sanctuary where we gather together. You speak to hearts through the music. 
and through the message, through the time we're together. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Now the announcements for Sunday school. Three things, Museum of the Bible. They have free seminars coming up that you can go and hear world-class panels. And I don't have the, my hand out. The one is the 9th, next Saturday. And it's a, uh, really, I can't, I don't have them. Let me think, let me think. Scripture and the Scribes. And it's, oh, it's after church next Sunday. So if you want to go, I'm going. That's next Sunday, 2 to 5 or 6. Next, it really is next Sunday. It's after church. <laughs> and then there's a, a few other things that following Wednesday, they're having a free seminar if you don't work in the day. Um, then the last Tuesday of the month, they're having a free entrance. If you want to go and just see the museum, you have a Tuesday you can take off. They are trying that, November, December. So you can go, don't have to pay the $25 entry fee. What about next Monday, Veterans Day? There's a men's bonfire. Any men want to go to Esquasco, I'm saying that wrong too, but it's only about 15 minutes. You want to go to a men's bonfire? It's a bunch of men in Southern Maryland from different churches. Let me know. Or I can give you the information. Go on your own. But. And then Thanksgiving Day, the 2 Peter 318 Friday night Bible study, we're having a um, preparing for the rapture. We're going to meet at a retreat. And if you'd like to join us in the daytime, let me know for Thanksgiving if you're single. Or if you want to come the following Friday or Saturday just to visit. It's a beautiful place. We're going to be drawing close to the Lord God. And uh, it's just an invitation to the Sunday school. And you can ask me more about that later. That's all the announcements for November. God bless you.
Good morning, Fellowship Church. Welcome to the first Sunday of November. And uh, find your favorite seats. Please stand with us. Join us in praising the Lord this morning. Victory in Jesus, our first song. I heard an old, old story How his Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning And I repented of my sins and won the victory no victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me Power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the Welcome you in this place. Uh, you worked through our hearts 
and the message and even the praise and worship, Lord God. Let your name be glorified. We ask this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How can I keep from singing his praise? With all his faithfulness.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you this morning for singing, giving us voices that we can sing praises to your name. Lord, we thank you for this new day. Thank you for waking us up for an extra hour of sleep. But we praise you most of all because you have brought us to this place so we can worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we ask that the blood of Jesus Christ, your son, would cleanse us from all sin and make us worthy not only to worship you today, but to come before your throne of grace. Lord, we welcome your Holy Spirit in our midst once again. May he move in our midst. Help us to feel his presence. Take anything away from us, Lord, that would distract us from hearing your word. Open our hearts and minds. Please meet the needs of each family that's represented here today. And we continue to pray for your nation, Israel. Lord, we know that you have preserved that place when Jesus Christ comes again. But we pray that for now that you would rebuke the enemies that try to harm your people. We remember the hostages once again. Lord, may they call upon your name. We pray for their freedom. We pray that they would release them soon. We pray for the election that's coming up. Father, that the people would come out and exercise the right of suffrage. Lord, whatever the outcome may be, we commit this into your hands. Because we know you're still in control no matter what happens. We thank you that we are a God of hope, that someday we will be with you, and that's something that can encourage us, Lord, for us to shine for you. As we ask these in Jesus' name, amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Sing with me. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are Place 
mountain fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. be seated. We went from summer to deep fall, didn't we? All right. Okay, we got a couple jokes. Let's see. What is worse than finding a worm in your apple? Finding half of the worm. What is the cutest season? What is the cutest season? Autumn. <laughs> How are you supposed to talk in the Apple Library? How are you supposed to talk in the Apple Library? With your insider voice. Insider. <laughs> What's an elephant's favorite vegetable? What's an elephant's favorite vegetable? Squash. <laughs> All right. We have breakfast coming up on November 22nd at Golden Corral in Waldorf at 9.30. So be there, or where they say, be square. So come on out, have some food, fun, and fellowship at 9.30 at the Waldorf Golden Corral. And the food is really good. It actually is very good. So come on out. And next Sunday is, what are we having next Sunday? Veterans. veterans Day. How many veterans do we have? See, we have quite a few. That's right. So we're going to have some special testimonies next week. And we're going to have, we're going to do the pledges. Uh, some of our young folks are going to come up and do our pledges for us next week. And then um, we have some uh, special music Mr. Ray's planning for us. And don't forget to wear red, white, and blue. There will be special prizes for our uh, veterans as well. So we'll have veteran tickets next week. So then on the 15th of, no of December, we're going to have crock pot bingo. Not bingo, but crock pot Christmas. So it worked so well. Everything went so good. On that Sunday with the crock pots, we're going to do it again for Christmas, and Pastor is going to order some special stuff to go along with it, and so we'll have good fun and good food then. Um, if it works out, Faith from college is keeping us up on all our activities, and um, she's trying to work us out a fun karaoke. So if you want to participate that day, after we have a good Christmas dinner, we're going to see if it, if it works out. Um, I've contacted Damien 
to see if he could get us some uh, good music that is acceptable for that. And we'll see who are our true singers for that. All right. At this time, we're going to celebrate birthdays. So our first birthday for this month, give her a big hand. She's over in, the, in our K-Wing, and we're going to take her over her hat. That would be Miss Colleen Gaines. So. Michelle Farmer, come on down. <laughs> Mike Smith, come on down. <laughs> Marie Windsor, come on down. <laughs> okay, I didn't call Mike Smith. <laughs> Miss Pretty Marie, so that's good. All right, Mr. Ray. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. in October, I think, too, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. October 29th? 30th. Okay. Give Randy a hand. Good job, Randy. All right, see. All right. Can we have bingo on Crock-Pot Sunday? Bingo on Crock-Pot Sunday? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Okay. All right. I, I, you might want Lorraine to, um, to sit out because she's real lucky. Yeah, Lorraine. <laughs> Good for Lorraine. All right, uh, Mr. Jim Crawford. Thank you. So uh, we've been talking about Christian citizenship now for a couple of months, actually, and everybody should know by now that Tuesday is actually election day. So anybody who hasn't voted already early or mailed in your um, absentee ballots can still vote uh, this Tuesday, obviously. And if you're 18 and have an, uh, an, 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 a citizen, you can vote. If you haven't registered to vote, you can still go to any polling place in Maryland and register same day and vote that day. And um, if you don't have, anybody, have any questions about who to vote for and some of the issues and questions, you can see me after church. That'll, that'll be fine. Um, we talked last week, and I just wanted to summarize real quickly about the, the P principle in, in politics, and that is... We don't vote for people, we vote for personality, not for personalities and not for party. We vote for policies and principles, Christian principles. And that's what I wanted everyone to encourage you to do. Get out and vote. Every vote counts, even if you think, think it doesn't. You'd be surprised. And you should do your civic duty and combine it with your Christian duty and vote. And I see Bill's over here in his garbage man vest this morning. If anyone doesn't know why he's wearing that, you should ask him after the service. Thank you. <laughs> All right. At this time, we're going to pull our raffle tickets. So um, first will be those. And uh, no, we'll, we'll do the blankets first. If you show them, Savannah, what we have. Thank you, Savannah. And thank you, Ellie, for helping us out today. So it's getting cold, so everybody needs a nice cuddly blanket. All right. Our first ticket for the first blanket goes to 297. 297. Miss Kim in the back. All right. Another one just like it goes to 284. 284. 284. Miss right right Betty. Oh. All right. Good job. Now we're going to go do the gift cards. Our first one, first $30 to Chick-fil-A Chick goes to 306. 306. Right there, Miss Roxanne. <laughs> Our next one is $30 to Panera Bread, and it goes to 270. Miss Joan, Joan Hall. And our last one. 
301 for $50 Wawa. Michelle Farmer. All right. All right, at this time, we're going to do the offering. If the ushers will come. Robert, would you bless the offering for us this morning? Thank you, God. Hallelujah. We praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. And Lord, we... Uh, Again, thank you, Lord, for all the resources that you have given us for the past and the present, O oh Lord, as we give to you, O oh God, Lord. Uh, we give it heartily, O oh God, Lord, for your glory and uh, for your uh, ministry. Use these uh, resources, Lord, for your, to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Thank you, Mark. Truly, the king is exalted on high. Please stand with us. We're going to welcome everyone with this song as the praise team leads you. Victory in Jesus. Feel free to walk around and welcome to uh, welcome someone to Fellowship Church this morning. I heard an old, old story.
Father. Heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. How great thou art. Let us remain standing, please, as you return to your seats. Yes. 
sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. be seated. I uh, spoke with pastor this morning. We have um, one of the pastors we're supporting in the Philippines had an, an accident this week and it wasn't his fault. He was driving with his family and a motorcyclist hit them head on and the motorcyclist passed away. Uh, we were not familiar with this. Our, our friends here in the States are not familiar with, uh, they call it courtesy for the family that lost the loved one. Even if it's not your fault, you have to pay the family. So uh, he he uh, uh, shared his his needs with us, and um, it's there. The family is asking about two thousand dollars, our money here. Um, so Glenda said they're not obliged. It's a courtesy, but in some areas of the country, it's quite common. Uh, even if it's not your fault to pay. So if if you have the heart to share, um, write, write the check to Fellowship Church, and then we will just send the money to the pastor. Uh, thank you, Pastor. I have a couple blessings I want to share with you. I'm going to grab this microphone. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, buddy. Um, my daughter lives in... Nashville, we moved her three weeks ago. That was the weekend I wasn't sure I was going to survive. We went from here to Florida. Tim, thank you, Tim. And Randy, where's Randy in the back? I may have mentioned this to you before, but uh, we uh, drove about 2,500 miles in three days. That's a lot of driving, especially if you carry antique tags. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but anyway, um, my daughter called me yesterday and she said, Dad, I'm uh, on my way to Florida from Nashville. I said, you're going back to Florida? She said, yes. She said, I got a boat. That's a blessing, amen? From all the way back to, Na to Florida to vote. That's important to her and it's important for all of us. You know, I... Um, I was told that tomorrow uh, at 6 o'clock uh, there's going to be a national day of prayer for the election. Am I right, Jim? So wherever you're at, you pray. No matter what party you're with, you pray. And let's see what God will do. I want to mention a couple things uh, since we're on that. And I have to confess to you, 
I'm excited about the election, but I've had enough. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen. I, get, I get probably 100 calls from people wanting money every day. I don't know who, if you've called me and I haven't returned your call, it's because I get mad and start hanging up, you know what I mean? But I want to say this. Um, years ago, when we had just lost, I think, our, our third son, we wanted to adopt. And uh, we wrote, Jerry Falwell had a law at the Liberty University, had a very big uh, um, uh, adoption program going on. And so we wrote to him, we wrote to several other agencies, and they said that uh, uh, since you have two children, uh, two little girls, that there's a very slim chance of you adopting at that time. If we were able to, we would have probably adopted a couple more kids. And we sure do love our kids. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Matter of fact, I shouldn't be saying this, but yesterday, our one daughter lives out in Hagerstown, and God has really blessed her and her husband. And they said, when Donna and I get old, that they want us to move in with them. And I want to tell you, you know, sure it's fun to have grandkids. And that's one of our grandkids. And uh, now this daughter of mine here don't want nothing to do with us. So, but, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But that's a blessing. Amen. And the joy of our children. And uh, we sure do have fun with them. So uh, when uh, we got saved, I didn't care about abortion. But it, I'll tell you what, the day after I got saved, I, thought it was, I felt in my heart it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and it's still wrong, but we could have adopted two of those babies maybe that were aborted. And I always think of, um, Jim, can you share that? She won't let you? Okay. Well, that's a blessing. But uh, anyway... Uh, uh, we, we certainly, uh, we love our kids. And when you get older, you really love them. Uh, as time goes by, and they're everything to us. And uh, I sure have enjoyed our great grandkids. They're, I've enjoyed them better than our grandkids. Amen? Yeah. I'm messing with y'all. Um, let's see. Uh, Andy, would you want to share a word? Okay. All right, now no preaching, just talk to us. <laughs> no I just, uh, the Lord's been laying on my heart with all this election and stuff. Can you hear me? How about now? Just something the Lord's put on my heart during this election and stuff I wanted to share with you. Uh, you know, we got a couple stories in the Bible and we know Jonah, he didn't have a heart like God to save the wicked city Nineveh. You know, he ran the other way. And uh, God said, no, I want to I wanna save that wicked city. And he did for another 100 years, but he had to kind of force Jonah to go back the other way. We know what happened there. The other example I'd like to give you is Abraham. When God came to destroy Sodom, Abraham pleaded with God to save that wicked city. Went from 50 all the way down to, I think, 10, wasn't it? Yeah. And God said, there isn't 10 righteous people there. I'm going to destroy it. I know my parents were looking for the rapture. I think some people now are sitting back saying, God, just go ahead and end this. This place is getting so wicked. But I'd, I'd like to leave you with having a heart of Abraham. Because, uh, the apostles were looking for Christ's return. It's a lot closer now than it was then, but uh, God's heart might be to spare us for a little while longer. So we have an opportunity in this country to vote, unlike some of our brothers and sisters throughout the world that are oppressed and don't have that opportunity. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Andrew. I love that guy. We grew up on the same block. That's a blessing. 
I want us to turn in God's word to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, I want to talk about appointments, uh, appointments, 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 medical doctors, dentists, eye doctors. I talk to many people that have appointments almost every day of the week, uh, doctors for hearing, uh, Dentist, appointment, appointment, appointment. Can I get an amen? amen? It just seems like we have so many. Medical, uh, mechanical work to your cars, getting your cars uh, worked on. We live in an age of appointments. Sometimes we forget and don't write them down, and I'm guilty of that. And then they call me an hour before I'm supposed to be there, and it's crazy. But anyway. There are two appointments I want to talk about to you today that are very important to my heart. Uh, one is the judgment, two, uh, two judgments. We are appointed, the Bible says, on the, um, we are appointed uh, once to die and after this the judgment. And uh, there are two judgments in the Word of God that I want to talk about today. And one, number one, the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, let's call it the J.C. Judgment. The second one is the Great White Throne Judgment. We'll call it the White Throne, or W.T. At the judgment seat of Christ, no one goes to hell. At the Great White Throne, no one goes to heaven. At the judgment seat of Christ, no unsaved people are present, just believers receiving rewards for what they had done. Also, our motives for doing it will be revealed or reviewed. At the white throne judgment, saved people will be there, will be there as witnesses. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3 says, Do, not, uh, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, Christian, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that you shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Let's look at the white throne judgment first. In Revelation we read, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Uh, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, every one, according to their works. The death and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whatsoever, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I will say this, if you're trying to get to uh, uh, heaven by works, uh, you can't get there by works. Earning, you'll be earning your way to hell. Only faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ gets us to heaven. The books were opened, uh, indicating more than one book. These books will include uh, number one, the Old and New Testaments. John 12, 48 says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in that last day. Imagine his word is going to be used to judge our lives. Another, the book of secrets. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, For God shall bring every work into judgment, 
with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We all have secret things. Aren't we glad that we know Jesus? Can I get an amen? amen. There are the books of works, Matthew 16, 27. Uh, For the Son of Man uh, shall come in the glory of his Father and his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to their works. People can do a lot of, a whole lot of good works and still be lost. I remember years ago at Riverdale Baptist, um, we had an amazing man of God. J. Harold Smith preached on God's three deadlines and one of the, the wealthiest, wealthiest men in our church went forward to get saved. And uh, several times, Pastor Fitz had asked him to be a deacon in the church. And he said down in his heart, he knew he was lost. And that day he got saved. Amen. Praise God. Uh, listen up. Um, the book of words... Matthew 12, 36 through 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account of thereof in that day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. We certainly need to guard our tongues. Amen? Amen. We need to purpose in our hearts Uh, how we speak, and how we speak to different people. And then there's the book of life, Revelation 20, 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, a young man uh, was in Townsend, the Townsend Detention Center. And one of our men was there on lockdown for 93 days. And he said one hour every 48 hours, a little door would slide and they would slide his food in. And uh, that was it. And when I think about that, I thought, oh my goodness, how awful. This would be like heaven compared to what hell's like. Can I get an amen? Let's look at the description of hell for a moment. Hell is a place of consciousness, no comas, uh, no drugs. People will always remember. Hell is a place of torments. The Bible tells me in Deuteronomy 32 that the teeth of wild beasts will be upon them. Another verse in Deuteronomy says, Their stomachs will burn with hunger. Imagine a person that dies without Jesus will spend all eternity in hell and he's had his last meal. Hell is a place of darkness. I go to funerals often and I hear people say, oh, he's resting, he's at peace now. Mm -hmm. He might be at peace if he was saved before he died, amen? If not, his troubles have just begun. Hell is a place of sorrow and eternal separation from loved ones. Just for loved ones alone, people need to think about it and get saved. Amen? Put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 13, 28. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you yourselves will be thrust out. Hell is a place of hopelessness. There's no second chance. You say, Pastor, I'm sorry. You can say, I'm sorry. But no one hears and no one cares. Hell is a place of tormenting memories. I believe with all my heart there's people in hell today that were approached maybe by a woman or man of God. Uh, I remember a guy named uh, Nick. His first name was Harry. And I gave him a gospel track one Friday night. 
uh, about heaven. And he looked at the track and he laughed at me. And that was on Friday. And he was a very muscular man. And on Monday morning, his two brothers came into my shop. <clears throat> and they said, Marvin, Harry was killed Friday night. And all I could think about was just a few hours before, I'd given him that gospel track. Listen, tormenting memories. Can you imagine today if we could look Harry up? And he would know that he was that close to the scripture. I'm praying that maybe he even read that scripture and got saved. In Luke 16, 27, the rich man, he said, I pray thee therefore, Father Abraham, that thou wouldest send Lazarus to my father's house. And I have five brethren there, and that he may testify unto them, lest they come into a place like this. Point number one today, we must all stand before the throne of the one that loved and saved us. Point number two, we must all stand before the one who knows all about us. We must all appear. I like John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. There's another one. Uh, uh, there's only one who knows all about us and still loves us. Can I get another amen? Colossians 1, 13 uh, and 14 say, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? I want to tell you, when I look back, I'm so thankful for my life. I'm so thankful for the years and the experiences that I went through. I had no idea I was in darkness until I got into the Word of God and realized I was lost and on my way to hell. He says, who hath delivered us, we're talking about Jesus, from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son and whom we have redemption through his blood and even the forgiveness of sin. Isaiah 38, 17. For thou hast cast, I love this verse, all my sins behind thy back. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? All of our sins, he's cast them, thrown them behind his back. Isaiah 38, 17. There's no bluffing at this meeting. He knows what occupies our minds. Often, I dream about old friends. You know, it's, I've been blessed. Mike saw, when he was in Vietnam, we're going to talk about soldiers next week, when he was in Vietnam, we got together, me and a bunch of his friends. There were four friends, myself, his mom, and dad, and brother. About seven at the table. And back in those days, we didn't have cassettes and all that. We had reel-to-reel. -reel. Anybody remember reel-to-reel? -reel? All right. And we all said how much we loved him and missed him. And the crazy thing is, of all those people that were around that table, I'm the only one left. Listen, I've thought about people over the years that I've lost touch with. And uh, I have no idea if they're alive, but I will tell you this, God does. And I will tell you this, I have failed over and over again to be a good witness for Jesus Christ. I don't know how you feel, but that's my heart. I'm sharing my heart with you today. If I could do it all over again, how many people would I show them the scripture and tell them how to be saved and invite them to trust the Lord Jesus? I've learned when you think about someone you've forgotten about or you can't find them anymore, can't get in touch with them, pray. Pray for them. Pray for their souls. Jesus ever liveth, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. Uh, can you imagine you pray, say, oh, yeah, 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 my cousin so-and-so. And you pray for that person. All of a sudden, five years from now, we're both in glory, and you see him. And he tells you, yes, I was saved 
say March 15, 2024, and you think, praise God, I was praying for you that day. Wouldn't that be something? Do we serve a great God? We sure do. Are you trusting him? I'll tell you this story. I had a friend of mine. You probably know him, Andy. Ted Fornell. He owned the, the uh, car lot on the corner of uh, Bladensburg Road and 42nd, I think. And uh, I loved him, and we were good friends, and I got saved and, and went in a different direction. And I thought about uh, Ted, and I thought, well, I'm going to get a hold of Ted and tell him what God's done for me. And so I called him. I found his number, and I called him. And he said, hey, this is Ted. I'm in the shop working. Leave a number. I'll call you when I get a chance. And about two weeks went by, and I thought, I never did hear from Ted. So I called him again, left him the same message. I miss you. Uh, I would like to tell you some things that have happened in my life. And uh, a third time I called him. And then somebody came up to me shortly after that and said, Marvin, you know, Ted Fornell died. I was leaving a message for a dead man three different times. And you, do you remember him? Okay, you remember his shop though, probably. Two, we got two uh, Bladens Burgers here on this left side. And, uh, but this is the next thing he said to me, touched my heart. He said, but they said he got real religious. <laughs> and I thought, most people don't get real religious unless they got a good dose of uh, salvation. Can I get an amen? So I look forward to seeing Ted. The Lord, he knows how we spend and give our money. The widow had two mites, and Jesus took notice. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Thank you for giving to the Lord. And thank you all for giving to our ministry. I mean it with all my heart. I'm glad that I don't know what anybody here gives. Or I'd just be hanging around these people and those people. No, I'm just kidding you. Uh, but you all have blessed me, and, and it's so neat to see God make our, every payment that we need to make. Sometimes I wonder where money's coming from. But in 21 years, we've never been in the red. That's a blessing, amen? That's because of you all and your giving. Moving on. For giving to the Lord... Remember he said this, uh, if you give a cup of water in my name, it is not going to go unrewarded. So we need to give. He knows how we spend and give our money. Uh, given it shall be given. We don't give to get. We give to get to give. Amen? And you can't outgive him. He knows the degree of our dedication. It's not about, let me read, I need an interpreter for my writing. It's not about show, but it's about go. Uh, I remember Don and I went out on visitation years ago. And uh, we, in visitation, you know, I said, Donna, I will do the talking. I said, you run interference. Now, Donna, I love her to death, but some dogs she does not like. We went into this lady's house, and the back door on the house swung open, and two of the biggest Dobermans I've ever seen in my life come running in. And I'm talking to this lady about things of the Lord, and both dogs went up to my wife on each side of her, two big heads right here. And, uh, but she did well, didn't you, Donna? She's not going to comment, but anyway, uh, the Lord is so good. Uh, he knows the degree of our dedication. Uh, do we need to make adjustments in our lives? Do we need to make changes in our priorities? Do we need to set some new goals in our life? Point number three today. By the way, we, point number two, we must all stand before the one who knows all about us. And point number three, 
we must all stand before the one who has commissioned us. We are commissioned to serve. We are commissioned to be lights in this dark world. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are to be witnesses for him. At the judgment seat of Christ, rewards will be given. Revelation 22, 12 says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be, as his work shall be. You can receive rewards and crowns. Listen to some of these crowns that we can uh, receive. The crown of soul winning. Uh, I don't think I told you this last Sunday. Red Corley, who sits in the back, who's been in charge of our tracks all these years, told me the neatest story about how he got saved. He said they started going to church, and he said he looked around, and he said, I don't have a Bible. Did I tell you all this last week? He said, I don't have a Bible. He said, but there's a lot of them around here. I'm just going to steal one. Red said, I'm going to steal one. And then he said, but wait a minute. That just don't sound right, going to church and stealing a Bible. So uh, he went to a Christian bookstore, and he bought a nice big Bible. And he said he didn't realize it, but the man that was running the bookstore took a gospel track and put it in the bag. And Red's got saved by that gospel track. And he's been in the track ministry, I know, for 20-some years with us getting those tracks for us every week, stamping them, uh, and what a blessing. <clears throat> Merle, and you all don't mind me just talking, we, he, you were somewhere, and he gave a lady a track, and she said, I met you somewhere before. And she looked down and saw and said, this track, I was at a funeral, and you were there, and you gave me this same track. <laughs> Praise God, amen? Hopefully, with two, one person <clears throat> given her two gospel tracks, the same track. I hope she's wised up and, and listened or read them. Can I get one more amen? Listen, the crown of soul winning, the crown of righteousness for loving God's appearing. If you, he's, I've quoted this verse so many times lately. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, what would keep us from not loving him? He came. He lived a perfect life. He died on that old rugged cross. He shed his blood there for you and for me. And he arose again from the grave. He's alive. And he's actually praying for us right now. Maybe he's praying for you right now. Or maybe someone watching on YouTube. Listen, there is the crown. You can receive the crown of righteousness for loving his appearing. The crown of life. For suffering, you know, I, I couldn't help but think about, uh, uh, let's see, um, some of our people here. Where is uh, Nancy at? Nancy, the crown of suffering. How many operations have you had? 28. 28 operations. And you know, she is such a joy in this church. People are always talking to me about Nancy. And the kids, uh, when we had Mother's Day, I guess, two or three kids got up and said, that's my grandma. And I thought, what? That's not your grandma. But they love her because she loves them. And imagine 28 operations. You could be saying, woe is me. What was that? You have a pacemaker? It must be wound up too tight because you're doing a lot of witnesses. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Moving on. The crown of life. Justin Olson's daddy. Do you mind me talking about your dad? He's not here right now, so don't. I, I wasn't talk, Don't tell him I wasn't talking about him. I was talking about another Eric Olson. He was a policeman. He was shot two times and survived, protecting us. And then he had a foot problem, and he was in the hospital for months. 
and now he's got a back problem. And you know, all those things, and I thought about this, receiving a crown of life for suffering. He has suffered, but you know what? He's always got a good attitude. And you know, when he sends me a, 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 a let's see, oh, we got to, forgive me. When he sends me a text, he never mentions his sufferings. He's always got a joke to go with it, and I do love humor. And uh, what a blessing. Can I get an amen? There's the crown of glory for feeding God's people, just to name a few. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. If your family member or friend is not saved, you need to pray, pray, and pray. Tell them of their need. Don't wait. This is the urgency of this hour. We that are saved are going to the uh, throne judgment of the Lord Jesus, and those that are not saved are going to go to the great white throne, and nobody that goes to that throne is going to die, is going to go to heaven someday. They're going to go to hell someday. What an awful place. This is reality. This is the word of God we've looked at today. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. <clears throat> if you're here today and you're saved and you know you have a loved one that needs Jesus, would you slip your hands up, Pastor? I know somebody that needs Jesus. Amen. Many hands here. Maybe you're here today and you've been encouraged by God's word. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that here? Amen. Several hands. Um, I'm going to ask you, it's not easy, but I'm going to ask you if you feel led of the Lord to take that person's name between you and the Lord to the altar and ask the Lord to bless and save that friend of that person. Would you do it? Would you come forward to the altar? If, if I asked you to, would you do it? Let's do that right now. Come forward. Let's pray. Let's see God do some great things. Let's look back one day on the other side and say, oh, yeah, that's when I prayed for so-and-so. And that person got saved, and his life was changed. Praise God. Open my eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth Thou hast for me Place in my hands the wonderful key That shall unclasp and set me free Silently now I wait for Thee. Ready, my God, Thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine. And you might have a a brother, a sister, a son, or a daughter that you know is not living for God, I would encourage you, with heads are bowed, eyes are closed, Christians are praying, I pray you'd take that child's name and bring it to the altar before we close this invitation. Please come now if you're uh, thinking of someone like that. Open my ears that I may hear Voices of truth thou sendest clear And while the wave notes fall on my ear Everything falls will disappear Silence.
silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine. Amen. Amen. We're going to close. I want you all to shake hands. Uh, make people feel at home around you. And uh, let's get ready to go out and uh, have a good Sunday afternoon. Let's pray. Steve, would you close us? Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, Lord Jesus, thank you so, so very much for this beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for this great sermon. Everything we're going to think and do in life will be evaluated. So, Lord, please do lead us and guide us in doing your will and pursuing you to help us to follow you and help us to lead others to follow you. We do love and we thank you. In your most awesome name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shake hands with somebody. Make somebody feel at home.